Oh, well, first, let me say, uh, Desmond and Emerald, wow. If I had had your services when I began recovery 35 years ago, uh, what, how different my life would have been. And one thing I've learned being in this class is uh, all the crossovers of all the people that are in this class, there's places that we, the work we're doing crosses over. But first, let me just say that uh, my pronouns are she, her, and that I'm coming to you from what we call New West these days. Uh, it is the land of the Kakite Nation and many other Coast Salish nations, Stolo, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, they all use this land, so there's overlap. And I want to start by reading you a poem. So I am a poet and I think I do speak best through poetry. And this is actually not the poem I said I was gonna read. So this is a little change. <laughs> I just wrote this poem and it came to me, uh, it was a gift. My little niece is 17, she's Métis like me. And she is always asking me questions. And she writes me and she wrote me this uh, Virginia Woolf quote, I am rooted, but I flow. Only 17 years old, she added, I am rooted, but I flow and I grow. And I thought that was really lovely. And I have grown so much in this program. I could, if I start talking about it a lot, I might just cry. So you may have some tears. But first, the poem, which really has a lot to do with this uh, wonderful learning here. It's called Rooted. I am a story within the stories of many. I am a paradox, one thing and then another. Parts of a whole that does not know itself, Turning towards the invisible, I can see the limits of knowledge, the places where formulas dissolve into knowing that can only come when quiet and walking in the forest, where the standing ones watch and wait for us to return to ourselves for the new stories that are waiting to unfold. Here, I saw so many stories that were connections and I had this Revelation to this first line, I am a story within many stories. And it amazed me how often when people were speaking about their projects, how it would overlap with something that I was doing or I could see myself doing that as well. And so what is it that I've been doing? Well, I am a writer. And as mentioned, I work with the SFU Writer Studio as the BIPOC auntie. And I'm also on the board of the Indigenous Editors Association. And I really believe in story, but I had started to lose my faith. I was really feeling discouraged when I started this class. And I've really felt renewed and revitalized and I have felt the magic of stories again. So I feel very blessed and thank you all, all of my fellow learners and my instructors, Yvonne, Shanti, everyone, thank you so much because I love what Thomas King says, the stories we tell create our world and us. So stories really do matter. And I would say also the stories we tell about other people also matter. So the stories that people tell about us matter. And that's where my work comes in. So I work with BIPOC writers largely, sometimes just indigenous writers from various nations. Uh, I also work with other BIPOC writers and BIPOC is black, indigenous and other people of color. And I work with them because as a person who was of color myself, I found when I was having my work edited, sometimes it wasn't, I just wasn't feeling like the person was getting what I was saying, or sometimes they would be offended by something that I was speaking about around racism. They would take it personally. And so I realized that we need that special place with people who understand the stories that we're trying to tell. Maybe they don't know them intimately, but they have an understanding, a common experience of being BIPOC. So we need that type of editor and that is my role. I am an editor, I work with writers, but I'm also looking to build capacity around more editors as we are with the Indigenous Editors Association. And why this matters so much? Well, it matters for so many reasons and this is just but one small example. And I will read because I'm not good at uh, remembering details like history, <clears throat> but I just finished reading Rooster Town, which I highly recommend. And it's about a Métis community on the outskirts of Winnipeg. And it was considered a place of cultural safety within the hostile white settler urban environment. It was what they called a shanty town on the edge of town. They didn't have running water. 
uh, and it was a real community. I think of Tent City when I think of this town. And it was in Winnipeg from 1901 to 1961. I was born in 1955, just south in Winnipeg, out down in Forest Prairie. So just south of Winnipeg. So I was living while this was happening. And what happened was the newspapers started writing articles about Rooster Town, and they were articles that said that it, there was a lot of drinking, that there were wild parties, that people were unemployed, and it painted a picture of the place rather than the community that it was. And so with that disinformation, and we're seeing a lot of this happening now, the city was able to move this, this little town out. So they move them out. And so if you ever go to Grant Park Plaza in Winnipeg, you're walking on Rooster Town, which I did not know when I was living there myself. So they move them out so homes could be built and Grant Park Plaza could be put in. And I know my aunties and uncles, and I know that what this community was would have been a place of community gathering. It would have been dancing and jigging and sure, maybe a little drinking here and there, but nothing abnormal compared to what everyone does after work, have a beer perhaps if, they're, if they like to have one, but also um, that they just really were not unemployed. Most of them worked. As a matter of fact, they worked very um, menial jobs often in the city. So it wasn't even true that they were unemployed. Uh, and even if they were, why, why couldn't they keep their home? Why couldn't they have running water? So this is just one story of many. So we need these stories to be out because we need to be able to tell our own stories as well. We need to be able to start dreaming. And so Thomas King also said, if we can change the stories we live by, quite possibly we can change our lives. And so we would like to write some of our own stories and we would like to dream, tell the, the history of the past, but also dream some new stories for ourselves. And I want to support writers in doing that. That is what I do. So my ask is this, and this is a couple of things you can do to support Indigenous and BIPOC writers. You could donate to the Indigenous Editors Association. We've been doing some fabulous work with the SFU Publishing Department, and we are building capacity around editors. We're offering training, webinars, and opening um, people's ideas of, to the fact that they could become an editor. We'll offer them some training, but also as a writer, you might already be ready to do some editing. You can buy BIPOC books. Look for us in the bookstore. You could share our work on social media. Hold us up. You can ask your local library to carry our books. And you could write reviews on places like Amazon and Goodreads. These things go very, very far as for us as writers. So back to the dreaming. There's magic. The stories we tell create our world and us. So let's leave with that thought and let's create a better world for all of us. Thank you. Big witch.